This video is picking up right where the previous video left off. We're still in part 100 underscore curve underscore fitting dot M, link to this file in the description, and we're gonna move on to lines of fit. A lot of this section is gonna be me skimming past a bunch of code. I'm gonna try and bring your attention to the most important parts of it, but the rest of the code is really review, and I don't wanna get into the habit of just reading it to you. So in this example, I'm creating two vectors of values. We're gonna consider this our experimental data, our measurements, the information that we're working with. Of course, it's just numbers that I made up, but that's what we're gonna pretend. Uh, ignore or fix any uh, typos that you find, like this one. And let me run this section. So here we have a graph. Our blue circles are our data, and the red line is a line fitted to that data. Let's see how we did it. So first I'm gonna use the polyfit function, and the polyfit function takes as input our x vector, our y vector, and then the degree of the polynomial that we want fitted to the data. So if I want just a linear fit, which I do here, I'll just put in a one. If I want a quadratic fit, I'll put in a two, and so on. And let me scroll back up to the top in my command prompt window, and we see the results or the output of polyfit that I put into this variable named coef. It's the coefficients of the fitted polynomial. So since I said one here, I'm going to have a line fitted to my data. This is literally the slope of the line, and this is the y-intercept. If I change this one to a two and rerun it, now there are three outputs of the polyfit function. These are the a, b, and c of ax squared plus bx plus c, a quadratic. All right, but I'm gonna take it back to the one here and then run it again. I apologize for all these errors that keep popping up. I'll explain those when I get to them. But once I've run polyfit here and I've got my coefficients for my polynomial, what I wanna do is I wanna take those coefficients and plug them into the polyval function along with x values that I'm gonna plot onto the line. So basically what polyval does is it takes a vector of coefficients for a polynomial, plugs these x values into that polynomial, and then gives us a resulting vector of y values. And these are the y values that we are going to plot to form this red line that I've got here. So anyway, I display that out, and then I have my plot right here. I'm plotting my original data as blue circles, and then I'm plotting my original x values with my new fitted y values as a line with x's in red. And I'm going to set my line width to three. I also put the axes uh, out a little bit just so there was more of a border around the screen. I found that easier to read, so that's why this is here. Now the error is occurring because I don't actually have the Sims package on the computer where I'm recording this. But anyway, there's a function poly to sim that I can pass my vector of coefficients to it and get a symbolic polynomial put into this variable as a result. And I can do all my usual like solvings and substitutions and any other manipulations that I would want on the symbolic expression that I got from this fitted line. So I think that's kind of cool. So I included the code here at least, but uh, that's not gonna work. Um, unfortunately, on the computer that I'm running. And then there's also the inverse operation sim to poly that will take a symbolic polynomial and convert it to a vector of coefficients. And this was demonstrated in one of my symbolics videos. And while I'm here, let me note, almost all the code that I'm gonna show you in this video works perfectly in Octave as it does here in MATLAB. This is gonna be one exception, and there's gonna be one more tiny, tiny little exception right at the tail end. But otherwise, all the code I'm showing you, polyval, polyfit, uh, wherever it is, polyfit there, is going to work perfectly in Octave. All right, let's continue on down to another example. So just another linear fit on some different data. So the data is, again, made up. Here are my blue circles of data, and I fitted a line to this data. Again, polyfit takes as input your x values, your y values, and then the degree of the polynomial that you want fitted to the data it produces as an output the coefficients of that fitted polynomial, a vector of coefficients. You take those coefficients, you plug them into polyval along with the x values that you would like to plot y values for. The x values get plugged into the polynomial represented by these coefficients, and then these are the y values that are calculated as a result. I plot all of that material, I change the axes a little bit because I want to, and then I did an extra thing here. I calculated some measures of error. 
Let me show you the output first, and then we'll look more in detail at the code. So I calculated a linear error and a squared error. These are just two different ways of representing error. We would prefer if they were small in both cases. It's not like this error being larger is like means this measurement is worse. That's not what's happening here. They're just different ways of measuring the error on our graph that we produced here. The linear error is a measure specifically of if you measure the distance from each blue dot to the point directly above or below it on the red line, and you just add up all those distances together, make sure they're positive regardless of whether the blue dot is above or below, and you add all those together, that's the linear error. Very straightforward, very simple. And the squared error is not that different. You just take all those vertical distances and you square them, and then you add them together. And that's the squared error. So why would you do one as opposed to the other? What's the advantage of the squaring, which probably seems like the less natural way of doing it? Well, anyway, here's the linear code. We do have an absolute value in there, and it's important because we need to make sure that our result, our difference, is positive regardless of whether the data is above or below the line. And for one answer to why we might square it, well, we need this to be positive. But that's not enough of an explanation. The other reason why we might square it is because squaring a difference between values will underestimate or reduce the distance when the distance is less than one, when it's small, and it will exaggerate the distance when it is greater than one. Because numbers that are less than one when they're squared, you get a smaller result. And numbers that are bigger than one when you square them, you get a larger result. Okay, well, why would that be good? The reason that that's good is because in virtually any situation where you're collecting data, there's going to be some sort of error, even if it's just in your instruments that you're using. So depending on units, and that's another important discussion, is that the units that you use will make a difference here. But depending on the units, you may want to de-emphasize those smaller miscalculations as simply measurement error which the squared will accomplish for you. And of course, the opposite, you're also overemphasizing those larger misses in your fitted curve. This is very much a context-sensitive decision as to like what error measurement you actually end up using. It depends on the situation. It depends on your knowledge of the instruments. It depends on the units that you're using. Suppose that you're actually using measurements of distance, right? So like the y-axis here is in meters, perhaps. Well, you could have a squared error that's smaller than your linear error, possibly, if the distance in meters makes it so that all these distances are actually quite small, quite less than one, quite a bit less than one. But if your measurement is in centimeters, well, then suddenly none of these will be less than one. I mean, depending on, again, what axis we're using here. And the squared error might be quite a bit larger. This is where things get subjective and thoughtful decisions need to be made about what sort of math we should be doing. And I'm just sharing it and introducing the code here. Moving on down. So here we're going to do a quadratic fit. So it's literally the same code as above, but just with a two here instead of a one. So let's run this section. And so we see a much better fit to our data right here. I again calculate and print out the linear error and the squared error. These are much lower compared to the linear fit. But that is always going to be true when we increase the degree of the polynomial that we're fitting. Because basically, if you're just fitting a straight line, well then you don't have a lot of flexibility. But if you're fitting a quadratic, well now there's a bendiness, a curve to the fitted line. And we can use that to make it closer to these points. And if it was a cubic, well then there could be a bend one way and a bend the other way in our line. So one thing I emphasize to my students is that just because error goes down doesn't mean that you're in great shape and you're doing good things. And before I even talk more about this code, I'm just going to scroll down to the next section and show you this right here. All right. So here, the line goes through exactly all of the data, and it seems great. And look at our error. Lower error isn't necessarily better. These errors are a rounding mistake away from zero. So isn't that mean that this is the best fitted curve? It is the best fitted curve, for sure, but it's a question of whether that's useful to us in whatever application we're involved in. Because if we're doing some sort of science, it is highly likely that this curve overfits our data. We only have six data points. You can't do anything in statistics with only six data points. You certainly can't fit a fifth degree polynomial to that data and call it a good model. 
And again, I'm going to talk through some of this code and some of these other things I'm printing out, but um, let me scroll down even further and run the next section. Here is that same fifth degree polynomial fitted to that same data. Does this look right to you? What I did was I plotted many, many more XY pairs on the polynomial instead of just plotting the X values of where the data is at. Because when I do that, well, then it's just going to be straight lines connecting all the data. But I'm plotting these little red X's and the connecting line through the polynomial that I generated. And this bottom left corner is what I want to bring your attention to. Now, there's no context to this problem. I made up all the numbers. But in most natural phenomena, does it make sense for it to go below zero? Does it make sense, you know, if we're modeling, I don't know, the frog population? Could it be negative five? I mean, maybe that just means a really bad thing happened to the frog population, but probably not. That doesn't make a lot of sense to have negative five frogs or whatever. This is something that can happen when you overfit your data. You get a model, a curve, that doesn't actually mean anything or means something nonsensical, which is perhaps even worse. All right, now scrolling back up to some of the stuff I skipped there. So in uh, example three here, we're on line like, you know, after 160 in the uh, code here. One of the new things that I did is from polyfit. So it wasn't just that I used a quadratic, the number two here, but I also set two variables in square brackets equal to the result of polyfit. I grabbed not only the coefficients, but this variable that I named stats. And I named it that because it's going to be a collection of statistics. And then I displayed out stats and it displays out like this. It's a little bit weird. Stats is actually what is known as a structure. And if you've programmed in a C programming language, you probably know what a structure is. But if you haven't, just think of it as a bag of variables, a bag of other variables. So stats is a variable and within it, this one has R, DF and norm R as further variables. DF is definitely degrees of freedom. Uh, R is a three by three matrix. I assume I actually don't know what that is. Um, and then this is the norm of the residuals, which is another measurement of error. You can read more about the norm of the residual at this uh, Khan Academy link right here, or just by Googling it. There's plenty of information about that, but I'm going to move on from there for now. Now in this next section here, this is the one where I generated this graph that like perfectly fits the data, but, and looks like a constellation. I again set two variables equal to polyfit here. I named my other one capital S. That's actually a terrible variable name, but we're gonna deal with it for now. And then continuing on down right here, I printed out the norm of the residuals of S. This is how you can access the data within a structure by using the structure variables name and then a dot and then the internal variables name. And I will show structures in this video series, but we haven't gotten to it yet. And then continuing on down right here, this is the one where I showed how the polynomial actually probably doesn't make any sense as a model for our data. The way I generated this curve is I created a new vector of X values right here. I didn't rely on the original vector of X values. I generated a new one with a step size of 0.1 to get more fine grained detail than the other would offer. And when I called polyval, I plugged in the coefficients and this new set of X values. And that's fine because then I just plotted the original data and my new X and Y values, and that's great. However, if I then try and do a least squares error, like the way I've been calculating it before, it's not gonna work. And if I try and run this, it gives me this error here. The arrays have incompatible sizes. The original Y values, there's only six of them. The new Y values, there's tons of them because I used a step size of 0.1. The way to fix this is you simply just regenerate Y values based on comparable X values from your original data. So I just run polyval again with the coefficients from polyfit, the original X data, and then I can do my squared error right here, which is what I go ahead and do. And there it is at the bottom right there. Well, I mean, it's, you know, it's ridiculously close to zero, so it's probably not meaningful, but uh, that is how you would recalculate it, regardless of what sort of fit you're doing to your data. Continuing on down here. So this comes from a practice exercise in the book, MATLAB for Engineers, fifth edition. It's a bit of a silly example, so I'm gonna go through it a little bit fast. All right, so here we have blue dots of data from the book and a single line uh, that's fitted to the data. Our squared error is 542, and all these calculations were made in the same fashion as the previous sections. But then what the book has us do, and I'm gonna use a hold on here to put more layers onto that graph I just showed you, 
What the book has us do is do the same thing for a different set of data. And it names the data like Y15 and Y30. I have no idea where those numbers came from. I really don't. I have like thought about it. It confuses me every semester. But in any case, they named one of their data sets Y15 and the other Y30. And let's run this one. Now this is the old printout from the previous section. This printout is from the latest section that I just ran. You'll notice the squared errors are completely identical. Here's the graph. It's a little bit hard to see, but basically the red line and the purple fitted lines are parallel. And I wrote this code to just check and see, like, is the data from Y30 literally just the Y15 data plus 10? And remember that one is used to represent true. And yeah, it's just, it's just true. It's all true. The takeaway from all this, I believe that the point the book is trying to make is simply that a vertical shift does not affect the line of fit. This is like if you're in calculus class, right? And you add a constant or subtract a constant from some equation that you've got, it doesn't affect the derivative of that equation. Well, it wouldn't affect the line of fit either because we're just changing the magnitude of all the values involved. We're not changing the relationship between the values. And so to extend it any further, this is not from the book, what if I take that exact same Y30 data and I just subtract 40 from one of the numbers? Just one, just to see how different it is. And then I run the rest of the fit exactly the same as before. Well, there's my difference right there in my ones and zeros. And then if I scroll up, wow, my squared error is a lot larger. But that makes sense because the squared error is going to exaggerate a single big miss. And if we look at the graph, we see now we have green circles and also this blue fitted line and it's all a mess. But this green circle right here is the one that I really knocked out of whack. And you can zoom in, by the way. It's just uh, rolling the mouse wheel for me. And you can kind of see the lines a little bit better. I'm not sure that tells us anything in this particular example, but you can do that. So that's the point of that. It's just that if you modify all of your data by a common amount, adding or subtracting a common number, it's not going to affect the line of fit. This next section is just a brief example of MATLAB's interactive curve fitting feature within the figure itself. Uh, the code is just borrowed from earlier. I just needed a plot to use as an example. This in particular is not provided, at least not through the interface that I could find easily, in Octave. So this feature, not this code here, this code will run fine in Octave, but this feature that I'm going to show you of the figure is not going to work. And all it is is going to Tools right here, and then going down to the second to last item, basic fitting. And it takes a moment to initialize, but eventually a window pops up here. And it's just a nice user interface for fitting lines to the data. So I can click linear. And there's a linear fit. It pops up a legend. And also, it even shows me the equation of that line of fit, which is pretty cool. And I can do other fits. Here's a fourth degree fit. All right, so now there's this blue curve fitted through the data, although I don't think that's actually very good. It's overfitted. I don't have that many data points. But in any case, you can even see it prints out the equation. You can choose how many significant digits to show. You can look at the R squared value, the norm of the residuals. There's even little pull down menus down here, or if that's the right word for it, uh, where you can scroll down. You can change the plot style, uh, whether you'd want a bar graph, a scatter graph, a line graph, and all kinds of other uh, options and interactions that you can do with your data here. So I like to stick in the code because, I mean, I'm a code guy, if you can't tell. So that's what I like to do. But this user interface does exist, and I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Uh, not a feature that I found in Octave, but the code still works in Octave. It's just this, you know, graphical user interface isn't there. And then very lastly, a confidence interval example. And I literally just pulled this from this MathWorks webpage. I'm pretty sure I just copied and pasted it. I think it's a useful and interesting thing that you can do with PolyFit and PolyVal. So I've generated 100 random bits of data, these blue circles here. And then I found a 95% confidence interval, a sleeve around this fitted line that if I gather more samples from wherever I'm gathering samples, I can be 95% confident that the new samples will fall between the pink dashed lines. The line in the middle is actually a different color from the lines on the side, but at least on the monitor I'm on, it's a little bit hard to see. So anyway, going back over here, I just create an X vector of 100 values. Here are my random values. It is linear. Here's the slope. And then the Y intercept is going to be a random normally distributed value uh, with a standard deviation of two and an average of zero. 
from polyfit. I calculate two different results. I'm sorry, I keep saying I. This code is literally just taken directly from that MathWorks webpage, um, which means that I can blame them for these terrible variable names. Don't name your variables P and S. Give them reasonable names, and certainly don't mix in some capitalizations. That's just confusing for everyone involved. But that's what they used for this linear polyfit that they've got here. So P is our coefficients, S is our statistics. Continuing on down, now here's something a little bit different too. Into the polyval function, sure, they plug in the coefficients, just as we've been doing, and they plug in the x data, which we've been doing, but then they plug in that statistics variable, which we have not been doing, that s, and they get two results out of polyval, which we had not been doing in my previous examples. They get the fitted y values, that's the same as before, and then they get this vector called delta. But what you can do with delta is you can bring it down here and construct some extra lines on your plot. So I plot my original data, blue circles, say hold on, plot my fitted line, so x fitted y values as a red straight line, and then above that fitted line, my x data, the y fitted values plus two times the delta. So two deltas above should be about a 95% confidence interval, it's normally distributed data, and then minus two times the delta, so below, two delta below that fitted line. And they're both as magenta dashed lines. And that's how you can uh, graph some confidence intervals. So I thought that was a little cool example to add on at the end. And that wraps us up for curve fitting. Uh, the next section after I do the exercise video is going to be on uh, symbolic plotting, and then we'll get into data types.